All right, welcome back to Bus Talks. And in this episode of Bus Talks, uh, we are going to be covering uh, Arsenal. And if you're wondering why we're covering Arsenal, it's because I've always wanted to cover Arsenal this season uh, because they are surprisingly at the top of the table. And surprisingly, uh, now in March, they are still leading top of the table. But of course, uh, this episode actually has been in my books for some time. Actually, I wanted to do this, I think, maybe somewhere in December last year or there, thereabouts. But then, uh, the guest that I had uh, to bring on is definitely one that was in our previous episode. Uh, he came on in August 2021. In our episode 23, where we got him on for a pre-season uh, assessment of Arsenal. And the guest is none other than Ice. Hey, hey. Uh-huh. What's up, my man? Hello, Ice. Uh, hey, welcome back. Thank you for making time to make this mm-hmm. recording. I'll try and get this up and about very soon. Uh, but for those that don't know... Uh, Ice is our local Singapore actor and I will leave the introduction to him. Oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> uh, introduce yourself, introduce I, yourself. <laughs> oh my god, okay. Well, thanks for that, Buzz. Uh, firstly, thank you for having me again. As you know, uh, you know I've been looking forward to come on uh, your uh, podcast again uh, a couple of times. And I'll tell you very shortly one of the reasons why... Um, you know, it, it hadn't quite panned out, um, uh, you know, until today. Uh, but uh, yes, so, um, you know, uh, this is weird, but I shall do my introduction. All right. Oh, no, just, just, introduce, just introduce yourself, then I will, I will fill oh, in the okay, yes. Ah, okay. Well, okay. So, uh, hi, I'm uh, Aizuddin Nasir. Um, yes, and uh, I'm an actor and uh, uh, I'm a football lover as well. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh... Yeah. Uh, uh, that's that's uh, on me. Uh, okay, Ice. So basically, for those that are listening, Ice is actually uh, one of the co-founders of Found Films. Uh, mm-hmm. It's a local production company, and mm-hmm. the Found Films actually have two short films that they have produced, and they have been and uh, productions is in the works. If I get the terms correct, uh, the two shows um, are Lockdown mm-hmm. and Not Fair. Uh yeah um yeah you're not wrong um you know lockdown the short film is uh has just finished uh, it's uh we had a private screening of uh-huh. it um uh, close door behind the scenes uh private screen because um we intended and we have sent uh, submitted it to some uh, film festivals and you know some of the requirements of this film festivals is that uh, we don't uh commercially or we don't um share this or we don't screen this uh you know uh in a widespread manner okay um so we have had to uh kind of like just you know have private screenings and hold back this film for the time being until we get the results so if there is any results from this film festivals okay yeah all right Mm -hmm. if i'm not wrong uh correct me if i'm wrong uh uh, lockdown uh it was Mm -hmm. the winners of the best short film 2021 at the canadian diversity film festival oh no uh that is uh, the the other short film not fair ah Uh, okay yeah so uh lockdown is currently doing its uh, round in the film festival circuits we we are we are praying and hoping for the best uh that would be awesome if we uh, you know, uh, because we got big plans for it, hopefully. Uh, yes. But yes, we haven't, we have not yet received the results yet okay. as of now. Uh, for I hope that lockdown uh, will get its uh, time to shine because uh, Ice actually on on the side he shared uh, he he let me take a look at uh, lockdown uh, because I so requested. Uh, and oh my god, uh, if I can just use this little bit of time and say it was very uh, engaging, very thrilling and, and very uh, captivating to me because it was a very interesting premise for a time that is relevant for all of us uh, and and not wanting to, to spoil it because I think it, it there's potential for it to be expanded even more. So 
I just want to say you and your partner. If I got his name correct, let me let me try. Let me try. Ah, uh. sure. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Nanta Gabriel. Yes. Both of you in that in that little uh in that scenes uh in uh, you know in multiple scenes, it's very engaging to me as a as a watcher, and, and I believe the script was written by your other co-founder Cassandra, correct? Yes, that's right. Uh, it, it, yeah, heads out, uh, you know, heads off, heads out. Uh, you get the expression. Fantastic job, guys, yep. and I hope it makes it oh. big. Wow, that like really, th- thank you so much for that. You know, like really, really um appreciate uh that that you even wanted to catch the the, the film, and um you know it's it's a film that I would say as both a co-founder of the uh, film production company and. As an actor, it's uh, you know I, I always say that as actors we are at the mercy of writers, mm-hmm. and um, you know the writing from Cassandra uh, was phenomenal. Like you know, it's really great writing, and she crafted you know a, a fantastic story. Uh, the characters were just you know to me it was such an honor to play my character. It was such a privilege actually to play the character because you know it was so well written you you know and uh, you know it's the sort of thing that you as an actor always pray that you get to do um and and you want to do more of it and uh, to be given the privilege of being being able to act you know and bring her characters to life you know was such an honor for me and the other thing as well shout out to my co-actor nanta gabriel he is a phenomenal phenomenal actor he's absolutely brilliant um you know i i I've always said that uh, you know, like he's one of the best actors that uh, you know that I've ever had the privilege of uh, watching, let alone uh, work with. You know, so you know, I'm you know I'm a massive fan of his. <laughs> so it was such like a, I was really really looking forward to uh, working across him, and yeah, I'm so um, I have to say, I, I, you know, I was quite happy with what I saw when uh, when I saw the. Uh, the final product. Final so product. just very, very thankful and grateful for that. Okay. Uh, I, I yeah. Uh, and I, I, I have many questions about lockdown. Uh, so actually, uh-huh. uh, I'm just gonna leave it there. Uh, now, Ice. Okay. Uh, yeah. Not fair. Can you share uh-huh. with me what it is? Because I was excited for lockdown when you shared, uh, uh the trailers on I think on your on your page, and mm-hmm. I'm also looking forward to not fair because I think so far the um, I I don't know as a as a K Wave uh, fan, people would say it mm-hmm. is the trailers and the teasers, and I think so far it's been quite uh, captivating to me. I think, uh, and I'm looking forward to see Not Fair. And Not Fair is a web series. Uh, yes, that's right. Uh, you're working mm. with KSP, and the director's name is Kelvin Kelvin Ng. Kelvin Sung. Kelvin Sung. So sorry, Kelvin. Yeah. Uh, yes. <laughs> Uh, yeah. yeah, Kelvin, not it's not um, Isa, it, it's it's just me lah. Uh, I I'm not so well versed yet. I'm looking forward no, to well, your you're not getting fair. There, man. <laughs> you're getting there. You're getting there, my friend. Okay, so yeah. go. Not fair. What's it about? Oh, yeah. So so not fair is now the origin of not fair was actually was a short film that we did uh two years two and a half years ago, um and then uh, you know Kelvin Sung uh who goes by uh the Monica the million dollar uh director because apart from uh, Jack Neo, uh, in terms of commercial, you know, uh, viability and success, he he is one of the only other few directors who successfully break the $1 million barrier. Okay. Um, and so, yeah, he, I mean, he's a, a, a very experienced director in his own right. Um, and uh, he, you know, he approached us because, um, you know the whole concept of not fair, which is basically the whole story about uh, you know colorism, you know the prejudice or discrimination against darker skin tones. Mm. Uh, it's it's not it's not a lot of people conflate or confuse colorism with racism. Uh, the thing is, racism happens between different racial groups, obviously, but when it comes to colorism, it can happen between and within similar racial groups. So you could be from the same race from a person, but because you're of a darker skin tone, you are either discriminated against, you're at the end of snide remarks and things like that. And so, you know, it's uh, 
it's a story again uh, that Cassandra wrote. Um, and so when Kelvin Sung approached us because there was a funding uh, from a government body Ooh. that uh, was looking for like stories about you know discrimination and bringing people together, he came to us and he said, why don't we pitch this concept to this government body? And we said, okay, yeah, sounds great. So, um, and, you know, before we know it, we were given the green light by this, uh, you know, government body to uh, to fund the uh, project. And so it's a five-episode web series. Um, there are some characters that are carryovers from the short films, but it's a... Uh, it's a completely different uh, premise. It's a different uh, story, um, but it's very related to the short film in a way. Uh, so I play a fashion icon, <laughs> you know, and anyone who knows me knows that, yeah, I would have required a little bit of uh, character research there, <laughs> um, you know, because I'm anything, <laughs> I'm anything but fashionable. I'll be the first to admit that. Um, so, um, it was like I was like, wow, okay, let's do it. So I, I played uh, I, I played a character called Nadir Khan who took on the role of a mentor of and, sorts and for the from mm. from the photos. He's he's a bit more on the flamboyant side, right? Yes, yeah. that's right. So, <laughs> so, so I, I, you know, while we were, you know, talking about, uh, you know, the character and stuff, I, I, I just it just came to mind the way uh, Cassandra wrote the story and the way. Uh, Kelvin, who directed, because Cassandra wrote the story and she is also the assistant producer and co uh, assistant director and co producer because I produced the series as well. Mm -hmm. um, so we wore multiple hats. And while, you know, while we were doing all the producing side of things, we were also able to discuss about the creative side of things, the story side. And, uh, you know, we went back and forth. Uh, and then I just, for some reason, just. In my head, I just saw two characters that I felt I could base this character on. Um, and the first was uh, Prince, the musician. Ooh. You know, because, yeah, so I, I, just, I don't know. It's just the fact that he's, you know, Nadir, the character I played, uh, his name is Nadir Khan. You know, and he's, I just feel like the aura, he's supposed to be this fashion icon, right? And, you know, he, because of his choices in life, you know, he has been discriminated by his own community in his own ways. So I just felt like, I don't know, it just, I just had, I just pictured Prince in my head. And then the other character that I uh, base it on is also Karl Lagerfeld, the uh, the fashion icon himself, the, the late Karl Lagerfeld. So I mixed the two together. Um, and so, yeah, so Nadir Khan um, was born, uh, I guess, yeah. So that was uh, that was thrilling. Um, yeah. So putting on multiple hats as a producer, as an assistant director, and as a, as an actor on the series uh, was really a learning curve, a steep learning curve, I have to say. But nonetheless, uh, it was yeah, it was a privilege to be able to do that. We have, I'm very grateful, and we as Fong Films are very grateful to be given the opportunity to uh, assume those roles. Ah. Uh, yeah. Hey, actually, uh, when you mentioned Prince, right? I I could I could yeah. tell. Uh, oh wow! Uh, uh, yeah. Give me a sec. Uh, uh, okay. All right. Right. Uh, uh, if everyone must know, I this uh the flow was disrupted because uh, bus talks is doing this on our own. Basically, we're doing it at home lah. Uh, but yes. Wow. Uh, Ice. Uh, as yeah. I was saying, uh, I can see just from the photos that. There was like a a tinge of a uh, prince in in just from the photos lah, and and when you mentioned that you know you base it off prince as one of the two, the other one is Carl I Lagerfeld Lagerfeld, and uh, yeah, I, honestly I don't know who he is lah, but I can see the prince, okay. and then I was like whoa, and it's it's wow. very okay. it's very interesting because uh uh I know eyes on on uh. Can I say a personal level? Yeah, yeah, of course. <laughs> yeah, on a of personal course, yeah, level. Well. So when he shares his his love for acting and and his uh what what makes an actor and all that and and I follow him, so I I get to learn and I get to see how he puts his uh, his craft into it and how when he goes from character to character, there's there's distinctions that he puts behind to make each character unique and 
I think one of your favorite actors or actors that you you like is Jerry Oldman, who is able to do that yep. seamlessly, lah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, he, I mean, he's what we call an actor's actor, um, you know, and he's an an inspiration to me um, because, like, what you say, and you know, I again, I I'm just very flattered for you to say that because, um, you know, for us actors, uh, that is, I guess, that's that's what you I would say only f- most, but again, I don't want to speak for Mm-mm. other actors, but we always aim to. Do not see as much of us in any role, um, because you're trying to bring characters that are not you to life, and uh, you know it's always the journey and the search of, you know, th- th- bringing these characters from a piece of paper on a page to life, and you as an actor, you, your body is just merely an instrument um, for you to, or a, a vessel for the character to inhabit. Yeah. And um, you know, and and so like um, you know, you try to make it as distinct as possible, um, you know, because you would know. Of course, there are some characters that have more similarities to you than others, and obviously, like at times that would be the case. But there are very rare occasions of you know where you are given where people you know you're given a faith or the trust by the filmmaker to carry a character that is so far away from you that. The thrill is trying to find that character, and to me, creating character is one of the many fun things about the craft. Uh, um, you know, like you, you you create something out of nothing, you know. And so, like by the same token, like with lockdown, like the character James Dandruff, yeah, yeah. who is you know, and it's a complete departure from the not fair web series because that lockdown is a psychological thriller, and um, you know the character. You know he. Uh, you know I played a a, a recluse. A, 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 you know, an obsessive compulsive, uh, someone who's blighted by OCD, uh, who is an introvert, who's just very awkward. Um, and again, that's not very much like me. So it was yes, challenging. I know. I was watching it. I was like, oh, it's so no eyes. was so good. <laughs> oh, my. Thanks, man. You know, I, it wasn't, I, you know, look, it, it wasn't, easy at all uh it was a very challenging journey to get james dendra to tea and you know I, i i was posing a lot of questions and it was thanks to the direction of cassandra as well and you know we we butted heads we shared we we go back and forth and you know i was just very lucky to be able to get an essence or a feel of of the character eventually um and so um yeah so i'm 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 Yeah, it's, it's, I, I, I'm very. It's 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 cool to hear, man. Um, yeah. you know that that uh, that's what you felt. Uh, you know, watching the two characters. Yeah, it, it's really good. And actually, I wanted to ask when uh, when you were explaining not fair because it's a mm. web series on colorism and whatnot. I was thinking, yeah. wow, uh, found films is actually quite brave in that sense to be even broaching this topic. And then you told me mm-hmm. that it's been backed by a government agency, which is. Fantastic! It's very relevant, mm. and I yeah. think it's something that should be discussed more uh, by the general public. And and I am looking forward to seeing uh, your portrayal of uh, Mr. Mr. Han, right? Nazir Han. Nazir uh, Han. Yes. yes. <laughs> it's, it's wow! Thanks, man. Thank you. Thank you. Much appreciated. Looking forward to. Uh, well, yeah. Just okay, so uh, for anybody who's listening in, uh, you all have just listened to at least 15 minutes of us talking about films. Uh, wow. Don't worry, Buzz Talks is not uh, transiting away from what is our... Yeah, because we promised you that we're going to talk about Arsenal, right? But then we went on yep. a whole tangent of talking about uh, uh, art and films and whatnot. Fret not, because this is... Uh, now then we start talking about Arsenal. Okay. Wow, so let, let's bring it. Yep. Uh, so, first of all, uh, if you have not listened to the August episode, uh, episode 23, please go listen because it'll be very interesting uh, to listen to this now. Uh, and there are many, many things. So, I'm going to start it out hot. Uh, ice. Mm-hmm. Yes. Give it in, to me. In August 2021 episode, many things that yep. you said about uh, Mikel Arteta, uh, the most... Mm. Uh, The most tippy top that I have to say is, you said he's not good enough. 
Uh, you said mm. that the selection of uh, an inexperienced manager is mm. uh, unbecoming of Arsenal and they are on a downward trend. Uh, now, yeah, 26 March 2023. Yeah. Have you eaten your words? <laughs> Have you eaten a huge slice of humble pie? Well, yeah. Okay, I wouldn't say huge <laughs> slice. Um, and look, I look, I have absolutely no agenda against Mikel Arteta. Um, you know, again, it's been a surreal season for us Arsenal fans. Uh, mm. You know, like, I mean, at the start of the season, if you were to tell us that we're going to lead the league with 10 games to go, you know, I would have called IMH on you, you know, because... <laughs> You know, like it's we we went. You know, we were we finished fifth. We uh, pretty much gave up fourth last season at the tail end of the season, um, which was frustrating. But then to lose it to those scums down the road was even more, uh, you know, heartbreaking. Um, and it was upsetting, of course. Um, now having said that, you know, in August 2021, I believe that we had just finished the season or was it? the season uh we had just started the season i think uh we, we finished eighth the season before yeah um now again there was nothing personal against Mikel Arteta, right but at that moment in time it really looked like and hindsight is 2020 right exactly. but at that point in time, i you know i did mention i remembered mentioning this in the podcast or if i didn't you know obviously i had a lot of discussions with friends my family members and you know all of that and i did say i'm not saying Mikel Arteta isn't wasn't going to be a great coach i never said that you know he he was he wasn't already a very good coach i never said that he will never one day become a great manager in his own right he could very well turn out to be a great manager mm. but at that point in time having finished eighth and having suffered, what, 16, 17 years of mediocrity and the slow decline that we all Arsenal fans could see, you know, and then <coughs> Arsene Wenger living, what, five, six years too late, we brought on yes. Unai Emery, right? The rot has, had already set. Uh, the decline was already at such, uh, you know, we had gone on a tailspin so bad, there was no discipline in the squad. You know, players were clearly no longer playing for the club and things like that. And looking at all our opponents, overtaking us was very painful. Now, finishing eighth, whatever you, whatever that is, is absolutely unforgivable. Now, you might then say, oh, what about Chelsea this season if they finish 10th? The difference is, firstly, Chelsea just won the Champions League two seasons ago, right? They they pretty much went through a complete overhaul of the system, the, the structure of the club, right? They went from one owner to another. So they are, they, they are in a transitional season. But you can bet your bottom dollar that next season, Chelsea will be back. And let's not forget this season, Chelsea are still in the quarterfinals of the Champions League in their worst season yet, right? Now, with us, we had suffered such a mid mediocre such a horrendous season that his inexperience really showed right he was i think at that point in time knocked out of the uh, europa league semi-finals was it the season after or the season before i came on a podcast but um we crashed out of the europa league semi-finals against villarreal because mm -hmm. he decided to play a false nine he never played false nine ever up till that point and then he decided to just play false nine right and so you know, it wasn't on him, but we needed, I felt at that point in time, we needed a strong character to get rid of the dead wood and to really restart the whole process. What I did not foresee was that the club finally supported and backed the uh, manager. I, yeah, I didn't see the, 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 the overhaul of the boardroom, right? I did not see that Stan Kroenke and his son finally put the money where their mouth is and finally back the club like they should have 15 years ago, right? So now, again, do, have I eaten a humble slice of pie? Absolutely, I have. And do I gratefully eat the humble slice of pie? Absolutely. I always say this to my friends. I always say this to fellow football fans. There is nothing more I wish to be proven than be proven wrong whenever I am, uh, you know, my outlook about Arsenal is bleak. 
I wish I'm proven wrong because it means that we are doing something right. And right now, I am proven wrong, and I'm more than happy to admit it because, to me, no one is bigger, not even me, than Arsenal Football Club. That's the only thing that we care about. That's the only thing that I care about as an Arsenal fan. If it means that I'm proven wrong a million more times because I doubt our capabilities, then by all means, give me all the pies in the world. I'll take it any day. <laughs> But now, now yeah. that that so far in in this season at least, uh, you're yeah. enjoying at the top. Your Arsenal looks likely that uh, they are going to win uh, the the league, but you know a, a sudden uh, implosion. Uh, mm-hmm. How how do you feel about Arsenal's performance this season? As as a a fellow uh, fan who has been watching his club uh, struggle the past few years, uh, yeah, it is a nice surprise to see that uh. Arsenal is not only uh, rising again, but they're also very competitive and also very uh, their proper challenges uh, in in the title race and uh, beyond that like the european uh, competitions and whatnot so for you uh, uh do you think this is like you know even though there's 10 games to go do you think it's like uh, it's all you know it's all done and dusted or do you think there's more to go uh, are you like you know sitting on the fence well manchester city, let let me be clear on this manchester city are massive massive favorites Okay. Now, to me, Man City could be eight points adrift, ten points adrift. Ten games is a long, long way to go. You know, we're talking about one of the most dominant teams in English football history, right? Four league titles in the last what six years? I think was it? Yeah, three or four? Four in five. You know, four in five. Yeah. My God, that speaks volumes, right? And You know, we're talking about, you know, again, Man City are massive, massive favorites. They have been here so many, many times over the years. We haven't won the league in 19 years. And if you look at it, we haven't been in a proper title challenge since 2009, right? The year when uh, we imploded at Birmingham, mm. you know, that whole William Gallas uh, crying, sobbing <laughs> <laughs> fiasco that we, yeah. And, you know, so... We've got a young crop of players. We have one of the youngest managers in uh, in European football, and um, you know, again, Man City are the juggernauts. They are the favourites. We still have to. We still have very, very incredibly difficult fixtures. Let's not forget we have to travel to Etihad Stadium. They have a. They have one game in hand over us, and uh, let's let's just you know let's just be clear. They are they are going to close that gap. It's going to be five points. We still have to travel to the Etihad. At the heart, we still have to travel to Anfield against Liverpool. We have to face Newcastle United at St James's Park. We have to face Chelsea at home, and we have to face Brighton at home. And Brighton has had our number at the Emirates for over two years now. Oof. I don't think we have won Brighton ever at home. If I'm not mistaken, we I don't think we ever have, have actually, to be honest, because they've they they beat us last season. I think the season before that as well they won. Um, So out of the last ten games, we have five incredibly difficult games. Um, you know, and I'm not even counting the five other games because there are no easy games in the Premier League. That's true. You know, yeah. So add to that the fact that men they have all the experience, they have all the quality, they have all the ability to navigate through this. They know what it's like to be in a title race. You know, they have beaten. They have beaten one of the best scoring teams or best point tally teams ever 97 points was not enough for liverpool to win the league imagine that yeah, right because it's, of it's insane, so, right? how how yeah. how competitive you have to be and how yeah. many games you have to win yeah but yeah uh, so so, you, is, so is i'm it, not i'm yeah. city and favorites man Let, let's be clear for now that, yeah that, we take that, one game okay. at a time yeah we okay. take one game at a time all we have to do is Each game, we give our very best every single game. We look at one game at a time, and that's it. Nothing more. That's it. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Uh, any players so far? Uh, or all right. Actually, before we get to the players, I, I wanted to ask. Uh, yeah. Since that uh, Ateta has got to where he is now, do you feel this is mm. start of the Ar- 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 Ateta era, 
Or do you still uh, are you still team uh, Antonio Conte because uh, Antonio Conte who is now uh, and mm. the scums that is Spurs and yep. he just had that big implosion where he basically mm-hmm. uh, it must be a joy for you to listen to that interview lah. Absolutely, my friend. <laughs> it was, you know, it was a joy, and you know what? He's not wrong, right? A lot of the things that he said. I, look, I have. You know my hatred for Tottenham Hotspur. You know, yes. you know how much I, I find them disgusting. But, you know, it, it it it's it's all true. You know, like, and I have had Tottenham Hotspur friends. You know, who who shared with me like, you know, they they absolutely understand it. Now, of course, you know they played horrendous football. Actually, you know, like some of the worst football I've I've seen in the league. Right? They 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 play so defensively, and you know they focus on the individual talents to counter. Um, so there's nothing attractive about Tottenham Hotspur. So there is some accountability on Antonio Conte's part of the equation, but he's not wrong. I mean, if you look at it, firstly, you know, I don't know, again, I keep saying this, right? I don't know what it is about Tottenham Hotspur that somehow they earn the right to be called a big six club. <laughs> Seriously, I mean, again, I keep saying Leicester City have more claim to being a top six club because they won the league, actually. You know, in in colors, right? You know, so again, this whole idea that Tottenham Hotspur has to win things, right? Again, they are not like any of the big the big five sites, right? They're not because they have had no culture or tradition of winning things regularly, right? Even in our worst era, we still won four FA Cups. You know, we still won Community Shields. We still got to Europa League finals. We still in their best era, apart from the Bill Nicholson era in the nineteen sixties, they have won nothing. Okay, a couple of FA Cups here and there splattered over three, four decades, some Carabao Cup or whatever it is, one Carabao Cup in 25 years, whatever. There's nothing pop about Tottenham Monster. So Antonio Conte isn't wrong. He's right. You know, and it really sips through into the mentality. How many more managers do they need to sacrifice? So many great managers that have come and gone. You've got Antonio Conte, you've got Jose Mourinho, mm. Mauricio Pochettino, right? All these guys. You know, of course, there are a couple of managers that I pray they don't get because there is one manager in particular that I'm very troubled by if they get because I think he would. Okay, I am a huge fan of uh, this. uh, I don't know. I'm I'm sure you're aware the Sporting Lisbon or Sporting Club, the Portugal manager, Ruben Amorim. Oh, no, no, I'm not aware. Okay, so Ruben Amorim, I mean, the guy who, uh, who... you know, I mean, Sporting Lisbon knocked us out of the Europa League, but oh, yeah. Ruben Amori has done a fantastic job, and uh, I don't think I've seen anyone this season who has actually outthought and outfought Mikel Arteta tactically over 180 minutes consistently for large parts of the 180 minutes plus the extra time. Um, and uh, you know, I've I've chart his rise. He won the league title with Benfica two seas- uh, with Sporting Lisbon two seasons ago, uh, against all odds, and uh, he is the next rising manager. And I I think that he could very well be the answer to Tottenham Hotspur. Um, so yeah, but but yeah, um, back. You know, I I I I would say that Antonio Conte is still a great manager. There's mm. no question. He is a winner. Um, you know, everywhere he goes, he wins, except, of course, you know where. Um, so, in 2021, would I have taken Antonio Conte? Absolutely. Will I take Antonio Conte now? No, no because, of course, Ateta has got it going, and, you know, there's absolutely no reason to change him for the time being. Okay, so that brings me to my next question, which is, now that you've seen Arsenal come this far, uh, for now at least... Uh, they are competing. They are competitive. So my next question is: What are your expectations now, seeing uh, for Arsenal uh, in the near future, and maybe uh, in one cycle, which is about three to four years' time? Are you expecting like Champions League, FA Cup? Uh, as a fan, mm-hmm. what's your expectation now? Well, you know, again, we're Arsenal Football Club, right? So. If you're Arsenal Football Club, if you're if you know one of the biggest clubs, not just in England but in Europe and in the world, um, we have to be winning the big trophies. Oh, we have to at least compete for the league titles. We have to compete for 
you know, the obviously FA Cups, we, you know, it's it's basically our competition. But, mm-hmm. um, you know, we still have to. And, um, and of course, we have to, we have to improve our European record because while we are, you know, supreme in domestically, no, apart, we are the third most successful club in England, right? We are the third most successful club in the, in English football history, apart from Manchester United and Liverpool, of course, um, you know, for a reason, because of all the league title tallies, the FA Cups, you know, the records, the number of uh, uh, seasons we've been in the top flight, you know, things like that, all the records that we've had, you know, the legendary players. But having said that, by the same token, our record in Europe has been atrocious, right? You know, we've won two Cup Winners' Cup, or one Intercity Fest, Inter, Interfest, Intercity Fest Cup and one uh, Cup Winners' Cup, which is the equivalent of uh, the Europa League. So, technically, we've won two Europa Leagues in our history. For a club of our stature, that is not good enough. Um, we have to look to correct that. We have to really make inroads. We have to start getting European honours under our belt. Uh, we have to cont- we have to build on the uh, solid foundations that we've shown so far this season. Uh, not get ahead of ourselves, but build on this. Uh, you know, start challenging for the league titles consistently every season. Um, you know, keep going for the league title um, and uh, to be competitive, right? And to finally uh, bring back some dignity and respect. To the name Arsenal, you know we're not we're we're not just any club. We're Arsenal Football Club, and you know we've been sleeping. We're you know for 19 years, you know me technically 17 years after the Champions League final where we lost to Barcelona. Mm. You know that marked the end of uh, Arsenal as a top performing club, right? So of course there were a couple of seasons, uh, two three seasons where you know we were challenging for the title, so called in 2009, and of course the season when Leicester City won the title, uh, but you know, really, we have slid down so far that uh, people have forgotten, you know, the mighty Arsenal. And it's time that we come back, you know. It's it's time for the comeback. And, you know, the fans have a huge part to play. You know, make no mistake about it. Arsenal will not be where... We are, will not be sniffing the... whatever you term as success so far this season if it wasn't for the fans. The pressure... The protest, the continuous over a decade and a half of, you know, just putting the fire under the cronkies and the bot's feet, you know, uh, making the club accountable for the decline. Make no mistake about it, the fans had every single reason and the fans had every single thing to do with the so-called resurgence of Arsenal this season. There is no question about the end. Us, we as Arsenal fans have to continue to back the club, but we also have to continue to 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 to, to let the club know, to let the board know, to let the, the the owners know, to let the manager know, and to let the players know that they have a responsibility and that we will support them and we will back them, but they have to give their absolute best. Okay. That, that's, you know? that, that's, uh, that's basically what uh, I, I share that sentiment with uh, for Manchester United mm-hmm. and yep. it's yep. not something and... that and I think so mm. far uh, from what I've seen from Arsenal especially in terms of uh, the players uh, unity the players uh, general spirit everybody is it looks like everybody is achieving a, a common goal together and I think what is the difference in Arsenal is that uh in purchasing uh, Gabriel Jesus and Gabriel Jesus and yeah. uh, Zinchenko, they got two yeah. proven winners uh, along with uh, Jorginho, uh, three yeah. proven winners, and then it it's united the team and allowed them to be a bit more, even though they're on the younger side, allowed them to be a bit more focused, a bit more, uh, what's this, uh, goal oriented? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it, it, the impact that, that, that those three winners have had on us so far has been immense. Um, mm-hmm. You know, the experience, you know, like when you talk about Gabriel Jesus, right? You know, how many league titles have you won? Four, three, you know, in Man City. Zinchenko, who is going down. And, and it's what a time to be alive because if you were to ask me in, in past seasons, 
who would have been my favorite Arsenal players. We would have been, uh, you know, a count on one finger and I would have given you an answer within one, maybe 30 seconds, <laughs> you know. But now, you know, if you were to ask me, I'll, I'll take some time. But I would say that Zinchenko is my favorite player. Yeah. Uh, in Arsenal, there's a lot of uh, you know. I love Bukayo Saka. I love uh, Gabi Martinelli. I love all these guys. But you know, Zinchenko. Not only is he a technically gifted player, because uh, that's what Carl Walker said anyway. You know, when Carl Walker was asked in an interview, what was fascinating was when he was asked uh, by a, a couple of reporters who he felt was the most technically gifted player <coughs> at Man City. You know, a lot of people were expecting, obviously, the great Kevin De Bruyne. But he said, Zinchenko. He said, Zinchenko is the only player that is superior to Kevin De Bruyne technically. And, uh, you know, everyone laughed him off, right? Everyone said, but it's very clear to see that Alexander Zinchenko is, uh, is one hell of a footballer. And he is my favorite player. And not just because of that, but he was, he's also a fellow boyhood Arsenal fan. And you can see that, you know, you can see the passion, you know, every time we scored or every time, you know, he's, it's like seeing a fellow fan. It's like, you know, if I had the opportunity, ever had the opportunity of playing for Arsenal, that's exactly the way I would have conducted myself, you know, with the, with the passion and the love for the club, you know, and, uh, you know, it's so nice to see. And, um, and of course, Jorginho, who in the right system, I've always said that, you know, the, the, the unfortunate thing about Jorginho is that, a lot of managers, and you know, look, I, I'm no way qualified to question a lot of these great managers, but you know, what I don't understand, and he has the same issue with Granit Xhaka, or what Granit Xhaka had, where you know, they were placed, they were exposed, right? And right. uh, they were placed at the base of the midfield, which really don't do them justice because they are not really the quickest players, you know. But when you surround and when you build the team up properly, when you move Jorginho away from the base of midfield, or when you partner him with uh, uh, Thomas Partey, right? Now, that is when you bring the best out of Jorginho, because in terms of his vision and his passing, you know, no one is, very few players in European football are as accomplished as Jorginho on the ball, you know? And so, and it's the experience. He's a Euro winner. You know, he uh, he's obviously a Champions League winner with Chelsea. And, you know, just watching him and, you know, watching his interview, he's such a great guy. You know, he's got this great energy and personality about him. So it's really nice to see that we're bringing in not just great players, but we're bringing, uh, and not just winners, but we're bringing players with great personality, yeah. Yeah, yeah. you know, to lead the younger ones, you know. So they've made such a massive, massive difference. You can just tell, uh, yeah. you know. And, and, and it shows even in the post-match interviews, the interviews that they did, and, and whatever the players have to make comments, uh, be it be press conference or through social media, uh, as compared to my own Manchester United captain, who mm -hmm. at, at a point of our recording just came out earlier today and said that, you know, oh, I got nothing to prove. I've, I've, I've proven enough over the last three years, which is, okay, I, oh. I get it. He has gotten quite a lot of flack he gotten quite a lot of, you know, a lot of... Uh, Are we talking about Bruno or... No, we're talking about Harry Mr. Beckham. Mr. Harry Maguire. He is the captain oh, wow. still. Uh, yeah, he wow. came out and said that, uh, you know, I've proven enough in the last three years. I'm, I'm uh, I think, 200 over cap uh, Manchester United players, highest scoring. You know, he started listing all his accolades, but... You, you know, once you start listing your accolades like that, you basically lost the plot already. La. Uh, you know, optics-wise, because you're justifying why you're, you, you should still remain as, as captain. La. That's a great point. That's, yeah. a, that's a great point, yeah. So, okay. I'm so, sure. to, to that point uh, about how Arsenal, uh, are, you know, are improving, are you going to give uh, Ateta another three years for... Because you talk about winning... Uh, Champions League more which is mm. honestly not one of the easiest especially when you got yep. uh, serial winners in uh, Real Madrid, Real Madrid. So yeah if, if you had like in the next three years if I could ask you okay Ice in the next three years uh, your targets for Arsenal is what one FA Cup one league title and maybe a finals appearance for Arsenal or what, what are your mm -hmm. targets for Arteta before you're like alright Arteta has he's done enough he, he is not uh, the person to take us higher. 
man that's a that's a great question that's a great question um you know again it's about what is what how do we see the club right how mm. you know what is the aim of arsenal football club right now w- look of course i'm not saying and i think we have to avoid as arsenal fans we have to avoid feeling uh entitled right you know no one is entitled to winning all the time of course if you're a real man, madrid you, cough, fans, cough, man, you, you are back to differ right but i would i would say that the main the most important thing is that we have to be competitive of course you know having said that we have to win silverware um uh, i'm not expecting us to win the league titles every single season but we have to come close but we have to start winning league again you know it's been so long like for a club of arsenal stature not winning the league title in 19 years is insane i mean you look through the history of this football club we have never gone beyond 19 years ever of not winning the league never right we are 13 time league champions right our dominant our our most dominant period was in the 1930s 1950s and 1990s right but interspersed between that we won a league title in the 80s we won a league title in the 70s of course we famously won the title at anfield in 1989 now if you look through the history of arsenal football club we have never gone 20 years or 19 years without winning the league title. Mm-hmm. Now, what I'm trying to say is this. We have to start thinking like the big club that we are. It's as simple as that. You know, no more of this talk for talk for talk at the start of the season. None of this anymore. We have to at the start of every season aim to challenge for the yes. title. We have to aim to win the major trophies. I'm not saying we're going to win it, of course. Now, if circumstances change like what liverpool had to suffer this season where halfway into the season they realized they've had a horrendous season in the as compared to how they've been performing in recent times mm. then obviously you know their aim now is to try to fight for top four i get that right uh, injuries happen so i would say of course there are factors that we will look at but we have to remain competitive the board has to back mikel arteta they have to support him that we have to strengthen this summer there's no question and one of the best things that you know there's so many things that managers can take up of the great alex ferguson one of the most one of the things i have kept saying for over 16 years now is that we have to strengthen from a point from a point of strength you know the one thing that alex ferguson did well was that just because he has won everything doesn't mean it stops right mm-hmm. he would buy mm-hmm. the best time for you to strengthen is when you're at your strongest because It that is, is you, you, right and so that's what we have to do now in the summer we have to sign in the summer we have to recruit all the players that we need right not to say we'll get every single one but we have to at least get a few and then you know whatever happens this season we're not trying to jinx it you know again man city are going to be the massive favorites i still expect them to be the favorites we are hopeful if we somehow whatever if we don't we have to go at it again next season okay. but there is no question that we have to win trophies fa cups we have to try to challenge for the champions league again i'm not saying that it's going to be easy but we have to right that's the point of a big club we have to go into every season trying to challenge for the big trophies we can't go into the season the over 16 years over 16 years You ask any Arsenal fan they will tell you the exact same thing I'm about to tell you. We would start the season knowing that we are one, two, three or even four players short of even being a decent decently challenging team. We would know that. You know, there will be summers where we know we needed to sign three, four players. The summer that we signed Peter Cech, he was the only signing that we had and we knew that we needed to sign three or four players that season. That summer, we only signed Peter Cech. Yeah, well, that's actually quite true. Eh? In the summer, they all yeah. signed Peter Cech. Uh, Peter Cech was the first and only signing, and I thought it was yes. a great base to have uh, Cech as, as as you know, as an upgrade to your goalkeeper. But then after that, there was no improvements or you know signings of from yeah. any other positions. Yeah, ex- exactly right. And 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 the other thing also about uh, what what I will expect Mikel Arteta to be is to grow as a manager. He's obviously got a great potential. He's a natural manager. His tactics have been 
superb so far this season. So far, right, this season. But um, he still has a lot of room for improvement, um, as with any young person in any walk of life, in any craft that you do. Mm. And one of the things that I think he can, you know, of it, you know, is to start to have variations because there will be moments in games where we become very predictable and uh, we'll find it a lot, we, we'll find it really difficult to break teams down because we stick to one certain way of playing. And we're going to break out of that. Um, he's got to mix it up a little bit. Um, and I hope he's on the way there. Um, yeah, but there's no more of regressing. Uh, you know, I, absolutely I, no more. Mm. I, I don't know whether he's, he's able to do that because... Uh, and and this is generally just a, a, a generalization uh, of Pep Guardiola uh, Guardiola's uh, students. Uh, yep. There's Ateta, there's Vincent Company, Zavi. and uh, who's Zavi. the other one? Zavi. Ah, and yeah, and Zavi. The, yeah. The three of them are actually. Uh, I would say their game plan is close to Guardiola, and I don't think one thing that I. I think it's a uh, Achilles heel of uh, Guardiola is that he's not able to adjust his gameplay to variations mm. like like you, like you say lah. Yeah. And, yeah. and I think yeah. his yeah. students yeah. also yeah. face that same issue because they are insistent on on a way which for most parts are are going to work out well but there will be that yeah. one game where uh, one or two games where you know it comes short lah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it, it, and it's true and what what is really frustrating is that you know I can see it after five minutes. You know, a lot of times, you know, what is very frustrating sometimes as a fan is that, you know, you can see something from a mile away, right? And I'm sure you have this feeling as well when it comes to United, right? Where you you can see it, right? It's there. It's in you. It's right in front of you. And then you wonder how come the man in charge don't see it, right? And then you hope that he sees something that you don't and that you're proven wrong. But then, again, you're proven right. Mm-hmm. You know, and and in games, a lot of times where I'll be like, no, we are being too predictable. I know exactly where the ball is going to be. I know exactly what they're going to do. And guess what? I I was right. Like a lot of times when I'm watching the match, I'm like, I know exactly what's going to happen before before the ball reaches the penalty box. Like I know exactly what's going to happen before we we approach the final third. And it turns out to be true, right? So, you know, we need to mix it up a little bit. You know, if I can tell, and I'm a nobody, if I if I can identify exactly what we're doing i mean heck, like a premier league manager will know exactly what you know what, what and maybe it's just me being overly demanding but hey you know that that's what fans are right you know yeah. we we support we support the club obviously the, the, the club that we love you know and we support the manager but it doesn't mean that we turn a blind eye it doesn't mean that we agree to everything you know there, there uh, is, uh, i'll come in for uh, ateta and basically any manager's defense uh, it, to to your uh, to your uh, should i say criticism it's not really criticism to your comment yeah. yeah i think yes he is a premier league manager he's supposed to be elite he's supposed to be what not but having had managed just uh, like a social league to make that yeah. key decision where you want to change, uh, to to change the formation, to change the way your team plays, it mm-hmm. takes. Uh, I remember seeing this article. Uh, it takes uh, courage and decisiveness to to want to go and gamble for it, and you yeah. have to have that confidence that what you're about to do is going to work. But at the same time, it will bite you in the ass. So, like for example. Right. I think one of my most um, I I used to help manage this. Uh, I would say manage lah. Uh, upon the request yeah, yeah. of of the guy who who made the team, uh, my own uh, at that time was a Saturday League team, uh, BPFC. We were losing, I think, four one in the first half, and then in the oh. second half we managed to catch up to four two. So this I think this was uh, one of our against one of the title. Uh, the title contenders uh, for mm. for that division, uh, and I think we had about twenty five thirty minutes to play. So I had to make a decision on because the basis of the team because this is Singapore, and the basis mm-hmm. of it is that we pay to play. So it was yeah. a decision I had to make whether we take out some people, and they had you know uh, first that was the first consideration. So people who pay. Ten dollars per game would play uh, lesser, 
Uh, mm-hmm. But I had to make the decision to to whether we wanted to win the title or we wanted everybody to happy. So that's one. And the second, because mm-hmm. we were losing four two, we had to change from a four three three, uh, to something that and you know lah. Sunday Sunday football weekend football we don't train. We we don't have time for training. Yeah. It yeah. just it was just a gamble where I told the guys okay. Uh, usually we play four three three. For now, we are going to shift to a three five two. And I think towards the last ten minutes, as we were chasing for, I believe it was a draw or a winner. I wow. forgot. I forgot the th- uh, the the actual uh, score line. We end up playing wow. a two one. I think two one six or something like that. Where oh it was gosh. just a two centre back and one holding midfielder just sitting, Ooh. and everybody is just attacking. Right. Wow. So it and was, how did that go? I I I. I think we won lah. Uh. If if not, it was a draw. Wow. I remember the ending was four four or five. I think it was four four, so it was a draw. But it was a very crucial draw because it kept them two points behind us or something like that. And it uh, Damn. it was it turned out to be a key match in in the in the league season. So, but wow, I felt that pressure as a mm. as a, a social league. I can only imagine the amount of. Uh, Doubt that creep into any of the managers at the elite level, because they know that oh. okay, I see this, but how am I going to change? Do I have like, but like you said, Arteta's weakness, uh, like like we both have said, Arteta's weakness is variations, and it's something that yep. you want to see uh him improve yep. on. But yeah, whether yeah. he can I mean, branch away and whether he can yep. have the courage to make that decision is all like up to him lah. Yeah, you know, and and that's uh, you know, like that's a fantastic, uh, like a a fascinating anecdote that you just shared about your experiences as a manager, right? And you know, that is why I mean, not to sound crude, but that is why these managers are paid millions of yes, dollars. Yes, you know what I'm saying? True. Like, you know, like you are paid because of this. Now, again, you know, I'm not saying you change it and it it comes Oops, off yeah, all the yeah. time, right? But Uh, you know, again, and I'm not saying that Arteta don't have variations in the patterns of play. I'm not talking about the patterns of play because, you know, there, you know, again, in the recent match against, uh, almost recent match at home against, uh, uh, last week was against, no, Leeds is this coming week, uh, Crystal Palace, sorry, yes, against Crystal Palace, right? Mm. You know, or Bukayo Saka's goal, the second goal, you know, like it's, uh, It's a new pattern of play where Bukayo Saka made a inverted, almost a diagonal run into the box, and Ben White, uh, Ben White found him through that, you know, through that beautiful pass to face, and uh, you know, allowing him to uh, score the second goal. So there was a new pattern of play that I did not see uh, Bukayo went on uh, this season. Now, having said that. I'm not really talking just about the variation of uh, the patterns of play. I'm talking about the variation of the approach, right? I'm not. I'm also talking about the variation of um, the type of passing because what we do, what we love to do, is we love to switch all the time. So, and and if you look at the way we play, right, it's like waves. You know, like you would see, like it's a tidal wave. Like no one stays static at any given moment in time. Yes, yes. We keep switching, we pull, and we stretch. The opponent's structure. We keep stretching and we overload on the other side. We switch and we overload on the other side. We switch and we overload on the other side. Mm-hmm. And it's beautiful to watch, right? But when you watch like teams who sit back and they form deep blocks, it became very, very predictable because they could just place bodies there. Mm-hmm. You know, so you know, it's. When it works, it's beautiful to 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 watch, and I'm not saying that it's not beautiful to watch so far this season. But you know, again, if you if you to ask me about room for improvement when it comes to Mikel, that, that's something that you can look at, like what you just mentioned. You know, what I mean, like um, you know, just bring a surprise. You know, like you know, just just a, a change it up. A different way of like, like you like you mentioned this. So it's it's like a different way of using uh, Saka uh, and, yeah. and a different way of using. I think one one of it is one of the reason is why they brought in uh, Trossard for for that. Uh, oh my for gosh! The yeah, right? I dude, I have been a fan, and I've said this so many times to my friends. I have been a fan of Leandro Trossard from the first time because I saw him in a European. I remember hearing about him, and I watched him in a Champions League game, and I thought, "Wow, this guy is a baller." I think he was playing for Genk at the time, if I'm not mistaken, mm-hmm. a Belgian club. 
And I remember, like, this guy is a baller. And when when Brighton signed him, I'm like, I remember saying on the very first match, I was like, oh, wow. Brighton got Leandro Trossard, right? But then again, you're not really sure how they will adapt. You know, can they convert or translate what, you know, the good form that they have even in the Champions League to the Premier League? And, of course, you know, the rest is history because he loves scoring against the big teams. You know, he's got a hat-trick against uh, Liverpool at Anfield. And, I mean, last season, he's got the winner against us at the Emirates. And, uh, you know, so when I read, I mean, obviously, it was a huge, Huge disappointment when we missed out on Modric, obviously. Mm. Um, but when I saw that we were linked to Leandro Trossard, I remember saying, and uh, I was texting my friends and I was posting online and all that, that we might have just gotten ourselves the signing of this January. Like, I, I've been a huge fan of his ever since I saw him the first time because he's such a technically fantastic player. He's he so good, you know. Yeah, and... His vision is so underrated. His passing, man, you know, I've seen him so many times threat some of the most incredible passes, you know, and uh, I I love watching him play. You know, he's so good with both feet. He is great in close quarters. You know, he his finishing is superb. So when we got him, I said, man, if this goes the way I, I, I envision it to be, he could be quite a key player for us in the... Uh, so far, it's proven to be the yeah, case. So far, so far, so good. So far, so good. Okay. And that brings yeah. me to the next question. Uh, Arsenal, any areas that you think they still need to improve? Because I think like midfield uh-huh. is quite sorted out. You got uh, Granit, Xhaka, uh, Pate and Odegaard. Then your front three is uh, Saka, Trossard, uh, Martinelli. And uh, when he returns, uh, Gabriel, uh, Jesus and I think Eddie Enketia. Enke- Enke- yeah. yeah, I think he's he's a good uh, he's a I would say he's a fox in the box uh, more than than uh, yes a, he is a proper striker. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah and, you're right. And Saliba yeah. is doing extremely well. I'm quite impressed yeah, with uh, William Saliba because he's like what twenty two. He's twenty two. Yeah, he's so solid and so composed. Yeah, yeah. You know, you know. It's interesting that. Oh yeah, sorry. Am I? Did I cut you off? No, 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 no. Oh, okay. So. Before I get to uh to 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 William Saliba, now it's interesting as you said about the midfield, right? The first position you mentioned. Oh, you know we're sorted. Now I back to defer. Oh, I back okay. to defer because yeah, because you know of course you know if you were to ask me who our most important players, I would always say Thomas Partey, right? Mm. To me, Thomas Partey is our most important, most indispensable player. There is no other player in the squad that we have that has that that brings what Thomas Partey offers. He is the game changer. When he plays, we are a completely different side than when he doesn't. You know, every single time we miss Thomas Partey, our chances of losing goes way up high. And it's true. Against Sporting Lisbon, he didn't play, right? Uh, against Everton, where we lost at Goodison Park, he was missing as well. Uh, at Old Trafford, he wasn't there. Um, you know, so Thomas Pade is key to us. Now, the only problem is Thomas Pade is approaching 30 years old. He what is... He's old? Yeah. Yeah. He's turning 30. He's turning 30 this season. He's what? 29. I think he's turning 30 in July or August. I'm not too sure. But okay. he's turning 30 soon, right? I'm surprised as well at first. But yeah, he's turning 30. Granit Xhaka is going to turn 31, I think, this season. Um, and again, we... I mean, I, I, I don't want to... At the risk of, you know, counting my chickens before the eggs hatch. Mm. Or whatever, however the saying goes. Um, if we qualify for the Champions League... I'm going to use the word if, okay? If we qualify for the Champions League, then... We can't treat the Champions League the way we have with the Europa League this season, right? Uh, it's a com- it's two very completely different competitions. The standards are obviously very different, um, and uh, we we won't have the luxury of resting quality players and exchange them with you know uh, less quality players 
during the group stage. So we would need to rotate Thomas Pate, not only because, you know, he's injury prone this days, not only because he's aging, but also because even if he's a 22 or 23 year old player, he can't be playing 70 games a season, right? Um, or that's the plan, right? 70, 60 games, I don't know, right? Mm-hmm. Or oh, 50 games. So we would need, we would need one. Now, not only do we need, we, we don't need only one central midfielder or DM. We need two this summer. Uh, the yeah, other is obviously have, for Granit Xhaka. Jorginho, Granit Xhaka and Pate, that's three. You want another two more defensive midfielder? Absolutely. And i tell you why. Because while Jorginho has been a revelation thus far, he's great, he controls the game. But there were a lot of times this season when he played where, to no fault of his own, it's just that he's not his strength, right? I mean, there's yeah, only so yeah. much... Yeah, his speed. So he was completely exposed uh, at the base true. of the midfield. And uh, next season, we have zero room for any of this. Um, you know, again, and Jorginho is what, 32, 31? Granit Xhaka is 31. Yeah. yeah. And so it is our most uh, experienced, but by the same token, it is our most aging part of our team. So we would have to replace or get ready to face these players out very soon. Uh, for next season, yeah, so we need not one, but we need two. And we're competing. Now, again, our expectations next season will go even higher. It's no longer just fighting for top four. Thanks to what we have so far been able to do, the I, we, you know, we won't ha- be able to help ourselves. It'll be, we can't regress, we can't decline. The aim at the start of the season will be to challenge again for the title, right? Now, whether we can win it is a completely different matter. We're not going to say we will, you know, we, we won't say we expect to, but the aim and the way we approach the squad building would have to be get towards that, right? And so, Jorginho, Thomas Pate, and Granit Xhaka isn't good enough because of their age and because of their injury proneness and because of all the factors I just mentioned to you to mount an assault on all fronts. So we would need to. And the first name that I think of, obviously, that we've been linked with so many, many times is Declan Rice. Declan Rice? Wow, that's going to be hard to pull off. Well, okay. So now, obviously... Arsenal fans, we can get overly excited as as any fan base can. But there have been recurring reports over the last few months that um, Declan Rice has agreed to join Arsenal. Firstly, because he wants to work with Mikel Arteta. Uh, Secondly, because he loves the project that uh, that he's seeing at Arsenal, you know, and the faith that we that we are giving that we that we're showing to young players. And he's still a very very young player, by the way. He's only twenty three, I think. And um, also because he ref- he doesn't want to leave London. If possible, he wants to remain in London because of his family and all of that. So mm-hmm. three very, very strong factors. Apparently, he has, had, he has held talks with Arsenal. Um, and we are fortunate in a way. I mean, look, Chelsea could still go on and win the Champions League. You know, the thing about Chelsea is that the Champions League is to them what the FA Cup is to us. Even in their worst seasons, for some reason, they can become European champions. So I'm not discounting Chelsea from securing Champions League football next season. Not at all. Uh, the one thing I've learned about Chelsea is no matter how shitty their league season can be, they can really go on and win the Champions League as they've proven twice, right? So if they win the Champions League, then Declan Rice being a Chelsea fan, a boyhood Chelsea fan, would obviously favor a move to Chelsea probably, right? And obviously, you know, uh, Chelsea would be able to offer... Uh, a contract that is competitive or even more tempting than us. But if that, if 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 Chelsea fail to secure Champions League football, and say we do, and of course I'm not going to say us, I'm not going to say that word because I don't want to jinx it. Mm-mm. But if we go on to do what we pray we go on to do, that's as far as I'm going to say it. <laughs> then, then we will become a very tempting proposition. And apparently he loves the way we play. Uh, Declan Rice is a fan of Mikel Arteta. Uh, he's a good friend of Bukayo Saka. I saw a clip recently. Yeah, recently when, on, uh, uh, on the social media, right? Yeah, where uh, they were reporting for England duty and he was having a great time with Bukayo Saka. They were joking about, they're very close. You know, they spend a lot of time together. So, 
you know, and apparently, like, Declan Rice is a good friend of uh, Aaron Ramsdale as well. So, I mean, I know he's good friends with Mason Mount. Of course, they're childhood friends. So that's that as well. But, uh, you know, you, just, you can only pray. And uh, if we get Declan Rice, I've got a friend of mine, Andy, Andy Poir. He's uh, the oldest friend I've had. And, we've, you know, he's a fellow Arsenal fan as well, as crazy about Arsenal as I do. And, dude, his favorite player is Declan Rice. He can't stop talking about Declan Rice. And this this guy has been talking about Declan Rice two seasons ago. Wow. You know, so, yeah. He, you know, like, even before I actually noticed Declan Rice, Andy has, he, every single time he saw Declan, he's like, dude, we need to get Declan Rice. We need to get Declan Rice. And at first, I'm like, really, Declan Rice? But, yeah, I, I would say he's right. So, Declan okay, Rice so would be Rice, one option. The other one? The other one, now, this might be a little bit left field, but, um, we were re- we were linked to him in the January transfer window, but uh, because his club was doing really well uh, and he plays for Real Sociedad, uh, he wanted to help his club secure Champions League football. So Real Sociedad is having a good season so far, a tremendous season in La Liga. Mm. Um, and that was one of the reasons why he refused to uh, change clubs. But he's very open to joining, hopefully. Um he, I saw clips of him. He reminds me so much, and I kid you not, he reminds me so much of Jabi Alonso. Ooh. He's, yeah, he's the faster version of Jabi Alonso. Uh, and he goes by the name of Martin Zubi Mendy. Oh, and, okay. Yeah. And Zubi Mendy, you know, I would, you know, a lot of play, a lot of people think, oh, I will mention Moises Caicedo or things like that, right? But I'm a fan of Caicedo. He reminds me a lot of Angolo Kante, to be honest. But if you were to if you were to ask me right now, uh, only because Thomas Partey is still there, the other player that I would love to have to mix the game up a little bit is Ruby Mendy. Uh, he's a technically proficient. He's a lot. He's he's the more dynamic, more competitive version of Jabi Alonso. But he's such an elegant player, man. I've watched his clips. Uh, you know, uh, you know, because I do, I do keep up with different leagues as well, like the Spanish league, Italian league, um, and things like that. And I, I was looking at Zubi Mendy and some of Real Sociedad games on YouTube and stuff, and I'm like, this guy is is a game changer. He's so elegant. He's so smart. He's so quick. He's exactly the sort of player that Mikel Arteta would love. Um, and uh, he's the f- more mobile version of Granit Xhaka, I would say, and. Um, I would love to have him and Declan Rice. I mean, if we have him and Declan Rice, Thomas Partey and uh, Trani Chaka and Jorginho as a fifth choice, my gosh, that is quite something, man. So, yeah, Central Midfield, as you can see, I went in-depth. I don't know if I spent too much time explaining to you. No. But... I th- okay, to, to be fair, no? uh, Zumi Mendy, for, when, when I hear the name, I thought it was uh, an African player. Oh, I, I went out to, ch- uh, to check out. He's a he's a Spanish player, and he's part uh-huh. of the national uh what, the Spanish national team. Spanish national team. Yes, he is. He's usually paired alongside Rodri, um, at the base of Spain's midfield. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Rodri is the combative one, the ball winner, right? And then Zubi Mendy is the and Busquets, of course. And then Zubi Mendy is the is is basically the the puppet stringer. He controls every single thing that goes through that team, man. He is uh. He's an incredible player. I, I, I'm a huge fan of uh, Zubi Mendy as well. I think he would fit us to a T. He would be very exciting. And he's young. He's only 22, I think. 23, uh, if I'm not mistaken. 24, right? Yeah, and and to bring go. to your point, uh, Thomas Partey is turning 30 on 30, yeah. uh, 13 June. June, yes. Yeah. June, correct. Yeah. So okay, Granit. so from what I hear, it's only your your main concern now is uh, the more primary concern should be DM lah because uh, like you mentioned, uh, Granit Xhaka and Thomas Partey are hitting their thirties, and and you you want to have somebody who's ready to take over, and it's also surprising because, uh, this is something that uh, Sir Alex used to do quite seamlessly. Yeah. Uh, he prepared the the younger ones to take over the the older players, and you know. Uh, yeah, exactly. and I, I see where you're coming from. Yeah, exactly right. You know, and and that's the thing. Like, there is so much to learn when you look at Ferguson. You know, I mean, there's so much that 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 you know. When I look back, I was like, yeah, there's a reason why he is the most successful manager in the history of football. You know, and most definitely in the history of English football. 
you know, um, now, of course, that is not the only position that I think we need to strengthen. Um, the other position that I think we really need to, uh, to sort out will be uh, up front. Um, look, I'm, I love, yeah, we need, we need, um, we need a top, top striker, you know, and, you know, of course people say, yeah, what about Gabriel Jesus yeah, and Liam Jesus was on fire when he started out. Yeah, true, true. Um, now, of course, he's been on a goal scoring drop for a while, but I'm not saying that he's not uh, a great player. I'm not saying we replace him at all. No, 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 I'm not. But again, just because we have one or two great players don't mean we don't strengthen. I mean, look at, again, I go back to the example that Ferguson, that your, that your club has shown during, you know, that, that, that you guys did during your golden years. I mean, mm. just because you had Cristiano Ronaldo and Rooney didn't mean that Ferguson didn't go out and buy Tevez. I mean, look at the travel winning side. You had Andy Cole, you had Dwight York, you had Teddy Sheringham, and you had Ole Unasocha. Right? That's yeah, your yeah. forward line. And, and you know, so, United, I, I believe Sir Alex's uh, uh, MO was to always have four strikers uh, uh, yeah. available to him and the four strikers yeah. are of different profile. I think uh, I think the last successful one they had was Rooney, Urbatov, uh, Ronaldo. Was it Ronaldo? Ronaldo and Saha, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. There you go. Yeah, exactly, right. And so, I always believe that you need depth. And I always say, and not just depth. You need quality, quality depth. You know, a lot of fans have this problem for some reason. You know, like, oh, you know, why do we need to buy? more players why do we need to buy this guy why do we need yeah i know this player is a world-class player but why do we really need to buy him? i mean we really got this player but that's what great teams are about you know like you can put you can call on anyone from the bench and there is no drop off a little to no drop off in quality you know like even with the signing of leandro trossard right a lot of players a lot of people are saying yeah but where are we going to put him right we got gabriel martinelli we've got gabriel jesus uh, we got odegaard and i'm like Look, I, there's no bigger fan of Gabriel Martinelli than me, right? I've been calling for him to 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 play when he was benched, and I love him to to bits. But again, the whole argument is, okay, cool, we've got Gabriel Martinelli, we've got Martin Odegaard, but what happens if touch shoot something happens to them, or what happens right. if they need to be rested, or what happens if hey, you know, you just want to change things up, or what happens if, you know, in games where they get locked down, right, and uh, you know. You need a different option. You need a different phase. You need more a different sort of player. Uh, there's nothing wrong with calling, you know. So I'm like, bring on Trossard. And hey, look, one of the main reasons why Gabriel Martinelli has found his scoring boots again was because of Trossard. He started scoring again the moment Trossard played. And he has, every time Leandro Trossard plays, Gabriel Martinelli has caught. And the main reason why is because they keep swapping. Now, my point of it is very simple. There, we shouldn't have this phobia of signing more quality players because we already have quality players. Yes, we have Gabriel Jesus, but would I love for us to get Victor Simon? Absolutely, oh. yeah. <laughs> that's really yes, very, I would. Very know. high, my friend. Oh well, well. Yeah, but hey, to, you know, to get back to the top, right? That's right. You know, I mean, look, this summer, you guys are... Look, face it. Let's face it, right? I have no question. I'm going to put money on this, although I'm no betting man. Obviously, we're not allowed to. But yeah, yeah. I would I would have no doubt that Harry Kane is going to join Manchester United. Okay? Really? Let, let's... Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, where else is he going to go, right? Of course, Man City, there's Erling Haaland. He's not going to go to Chelsea because of his ties with Tottenham. Of course, he's not coming to us because, you know, he's just not going to. That's impossible. He's not going to go to Liverpool because they just had Darwin Nunes and Cody Gakpo. That's true. So, where's he, right? So, is he going to go to Newcastle? I mean, sure, but, you know, Isak is there and uh, it depends on whether they can secure Champions League football. The one team that I think is the front runner for, the, for Harry Kane will be you guys. And does it mean that, hey, you know, like, hey, what about Marcus Rashford, you know? So what if you have Marcus Rashford? Uh, Marcus Rashford is, is not a he's not a striker. Right, he's uh he's he he's, comes in from the left, yeah, he's right? He's an inside forward, yeah. yes. He's not a inside winger, forward, yeah. but but yeah. he's an inside forward, yeah. Right, yeah, right. So, 
you know, to your point, again, just like what you said, these are signings that we have to make or the, the type of signings we have try, we have to try to make to have a chance at staying where or, 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 or not stagnating, right? To keep progressing because everyone's going to strengthen, right? Liverpool is going to strengthen, obviously. Um, in different areas, I don't think they're going to strengthen up front. I think they're going to strengthen elsewhere. Maybe if Firmino yeah. leaves, they might yeah. go for a Firmino type of player. Um, of course, you guys are going to strengthen. Chelsea, no question. I mean, they're, really, they're, they're going to welcome, I think, Nkuku. They've signed Nkuku, uh, right? Uh, Tottenham, obviously, with the money that they get from Harry Kane, most likely they would they would replenish that. They would they would recycle that the money. You know, Newcastle United are going to go out there if they qualify for Europa League. They're going to strengthen. If they go for if they qualify for the Champions League, oh my gosh, they're going to go for again a player of top quality, most likely. You know, City goes without saying. So we have to we have to keep strengthening, and up front we have to we gotta strengthen up front. I think that we need another top centre-back. You know, uh, we've got Saliba and Gabriel, yes. We signed Jakub Kivio, who's very promising. He still has young. chinks in his armour and he yeah. needs to... Yeah, he's still young, so he needs to adapt. Rob Holding for for all... Look, I am grateful for Rob Holding for his selflessness, but let's be clear. He is at best a fifth choice centre-back at a top club or a club that wants to be back at the top. So we need one more centre-back. And as much as I threat the idea of losing Katie, Kieran Tierney, but if Newcastle United is successful in, the... in getting Tierney, yeah, we will need a backup or someone to compete with Zinchenko, uh, a left-back. And the final... Point... Considering that Tierney was, I think, like a top-choice striker like one yeah. season ago? Yeah, he was my favorite player last season, man. He was, you ask any Arsenal fan during our darkest period, He's Kieran Tierney spot. is one of the two players. Yeah, he was the bright spot, man. He was the he was the only hope that we had, uh, you know. And uh, but hey, you know that's football. You know things change very quickly. I don't want to see him it's leave. Cruel, uh, yeah, yeah, but you know, Ateta's uh system of uh, playing with inside fullback, you know, the false fullback, fullback um, tactic, I don't think it it does KT uh, justice because he is your traditional out-and-out out overlapping uh, full back, throttle yeah. fullback. Yeah, yeah. yeah, you know, so that's the only reason. I don't want to see him leave, um, but if he does leave, we need a left back. And I think the final position would be a uh, backup to uh, or someone to compete with Bukayo because Touchwood Bukayo has been, you it's know, be performing so well. Yeah. yeah, but it's a bit risky to just rely on him. Um, I don't think Reese uh, is good enough to be honest to start. He tends to make he tends to produce or he tends to make impact. From the bench, uh, he's not so much a, a a starter, if you ask me. Uh, so we'll need a a winger, man. We'll need a winger to compete with Bukayo. Okay, so that's two defensive mids, uh, one top quality striker, uh, one backup left back, and one um, winger. Hmm? Yes. Okay. And okay. one centre back. Oh yes, and one and and one centre back. Well, that's uh. I guess in in the way that you've went is the is the order of priority that they should be getting players for. Yes, in my opinion, yes, okay. absolutely. So, uh, yeah, it has been an enjoyable close to one and a half hours, uh, oh uh talking to you, Ice. Uh, oh, and wow. I think and I think a lot of the things uh that you have shared uh, is something I've learned about new players today, which was what ex- exactly happened in. Uh, the last uh, podcast that we had together in two zero two one. I think you yeah. talked about. Oh shoot! Who was it? Uh? Uh, ah, I I I cannot bring bring the name to mind. Uh, at the moment, maybe I'll oh. just edit in in post or something. Uh, but uh, there was a few players that I actually uh, highlighted ones to watch. Uh, that actually blossom in the in the three years uh, since we had in the two years since we had that interview. So. If oh. you are listening to this, 
uh, that Real Sociedad uh, midfielder. Uh, can I have his name again? Yes, uh, Martin Zubi Mendy. Ah, Zubi Mendy. You should go yes, and check it out Zubi because uh, if there is anything that I've learned from uh, having this uh, talks, uh, this podcast session with Ice, dude really went, uh, goes out to to watch the games and he's he has. In my opinion, he has a eye or spotting really rare gems, lah. Oh wow! <laughs> Thanks, man. Yeah, no, I... <laughs> re- really, really, because it's not even I don't watch like uh all all the you know the different leagues. Uh, I I usually catch just EPL or when I have the time. Uh, some of the bigger La Liga games like Atletico Madrid because I'm I'm a fan of Atletico Madrid. Oh uh, yeah, 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 yeah. So so. There are some games that I think the only other player that I keep a lookout for uh, is Takefusa Kubo. But that's only because oh, I have a personal really? affinity with him uh, having played him in my, in my FIFA game. Yeah, in ah, FIFA. I knew it. Yeah. <laughs> he was a rare gem that I found that uh, I thought like, hey, he should be kicking it on in the bigger leagues. Uh, so yeah. yeah. So yes, uh, please go watch this. And now... To close off, uh, <clears throat> what what we have started on the, in this channel is that, uh, uh, and this is blatantly ripping off from uh, another big podcast in Singapore, uh, Yala But, uh, where they have uh, one shock thing. But uh, ours is more of what has there been any um, any interesting or funny news uh, in the footballing scene that you like and that you would like to share. Funny, of course. Anything that you can know, capture of... your your imagination, uh. yeah. So so sorry to interrupt. Yes, go on. No, no, no. All good, man. I mean, obviously, I'm very tempted to say the Antonio Conte press conference. <laughs> that was hilarious. <laughs> hey, that, that's actually uh, that's actually a good word. Eh? <laughs> it was really man. Like, it no. Uh, when that when that uh news broke out and the the final, I think the final thing that Conte said, this is what Spurs are. Basically, it yep. summed up to that line where everybody keeps saying Spurs, Spurs being Spursy, and I was like, "Oh my god, this is." Yeah. He went uh, it's such like, a long way to say that. Yeah, it's like his own, their own manager saying, "Hey guys, look, it's Tottenham Hotspur." <laughs> you, know, you know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. that, so that, that was freaking hilarious, man. Exactly. That made my. Yeah. How, how, do you think he will stay? I think he's he's about to get oh. kicked out, right? I think so. He flew back to Italy, didn't he? Yeah, I th- during the international week, yeah. I think he's just like ah, oh, he turned out of that. Okay, in in the same line. Okay, so that's yours, Antonio Conte's. Uh, yes. Uh, okay, then what mine, about you? Mine will be uh, uh, Bayern Munich manager too, where Nagelsmann was just booted out while he was away with family uh, oh, skiing. Yeah. In, yeah, in Austria, right? Yeah. Holy. And and they Man, didn't tell him. And I think the CEO like uh, Herbert Heiner. Just hours prior, or maybe a day ago or two days ago, talked about how like, oh yeah, Bayern is completely committed to the yes. Nagelsmann. Yeah. Wow! And, and it's the whole drama. okay. And if you thought that was a uh, really cruel, really random, right? Yeah. Julian Nagelsmann has uh has a hundred percent record in the Champions League this season, and he he is oh. only one point off the top uh of uh Borussia Dortmund, right? Dortmund who are leading. And they have the yeah. uh, the classica coming up, I think, uh, after mm. the international break, which is can that that's that's insane, man. Why why yeah. are you just yeeting out your manager like that? I know that's the thing. I, I don't. I heard that the, you know, like the whole like oh, you know, them losing the ten points was down to him. I I I heard that that was just an excuse, right? Because yeah, yeah. He hasn't gotten along well with uh, Oliver Kahn and Hasan Salihad Mitzic, the Bayern board, I think. Um, he can be quite an abrasive guy, I heard. Nagelsmann. Yes. So, right? So I think they were just trying to find an opening. Okay, and anyway. the other thing I heard, of course, was that they were afraid that Thomas Tuchel, uh, you know, Tottenham Hotspur or Real Madrid was going to approach uh, Tuchel. Thomas Tuchel. Right. So they 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 wanted to make the move before thought uh, before Spurs or uh, Madrid made the move, you know. Uh, so why would Madrid hmm. make the move when uh, Carlo Ancelotti has 
has been leading them so well. That's insane, you know. Don Carlo has been doing so well since he shifted back from Everton. Yeah, but I heard that apparently Don Carlo is going to... He's Dyer. the odds-on favourite to take over Brazil. Ah, okay. Yeah. I, I think apparently... Was it Edison or Ellison? I think Edison came out and spoke about how he's he's heard like news that Don Carlo will be the new Brazil manager and they're all like he jokingly yeah, said that he, he's going to do his his best to knock them out, City yeah. to knock Real Madrid out so that that would expedite his, his uh, yeah, his arrival at the uh, Brazilian uh, hot seat. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, uh, speaking of like funny story, uh, since we brought up Don Carlo, I don't know whether you know this, but actually when, uh, how Don Carlo went back from Everton to Real Madrid, was very huh? innocent. He actually called up Real Madrid to say, "Hey, uh-huh. uh, you guys got any players that you don't want that you're interested on in selling or loaning to us?" And then uh-huh. uh, Real Madrid said, uh, "Hey, actually, uh, we are interested in bringing you back to be our manager. You were or not?" <laughs> are you serious? Yeah, yeah I, serious. I re- I read that in a, in one of the reports uh, or on how it happened uh, and. Uh, I cannot find the article now because it, I read that uh, like one as you are, you know, randomly reading random football articles and yeah. allegedly that is the true story and then the moment uh, uh, Real Madrid offered that to Don Carlo, then go, Don Carlo, oh, you for real? Oh, okay, I'll be there, man. Wow! Yeah. What the hell? <laughs> Imagine that. <laughs> Whoa! You, if that could have, imagine that could have been anyone. You know what I mean? Like, imagine Klopp just called, hey guys, um, you know, is there anyone? Hey, uh, oh yeah, by the way, Jürgen, you know, like, just thinking, we want you, uh, you are not. Yeah, I, I mean, <laughs> it's, it's cheeky, but you know, it, it works and, and it got them to yeah. uh, a title last season. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They won the Champions League and the double, right? Yeah, they won the they Champions the League. Which is, the... is insane. Yeah. Huh? yeah, insane, man. Yeah. Dang. Okay. Wow. Uh, I, I didn't know that. Uh, That's funny. Thank you so much uh, for your time. Uh, and this always is fun. going to be, uh, as always, as, as your last uh, podcast, we love to have you here because most of it is <laughs> you are sharing a lot of things and I'm listening, which I love. Uh, and yeah, all the best to us now. And I will definitely uh, ask you for, uh, for some words when Arsenal... If, if Arsenal uh, win uh, the Premier League this season. I don't want to jinx it because uh, Ice, Ice also wants to be, you know, uh, touch wood, don't, don't want to count the eggs and yes. the hatch. Yes. And and just one last thing as well. Sure. Uh, last two things, of course. One of the main reasons why it took quite a while, I think I mentioned earlier uh, that I was going to share with you. Of course, it was my schedule, you know. But the other thing as well, this uh, slight thing in me where I'm like, you know what? I don't want to jinx this. Ah. You know, we're on a good run. So I don't want to do anything different. I don't want to say anything what? that that might jinx things. So I'm, you know, you know, so that's a part of me that for a long time, I was like, you know what? Let's just wait till the end of the season, you know. But of course, you know, I've got mad love for you. So uh, I'm risking it all, thank man. Thank you, thank you, thank you. That is so <laughs> kind. Because, yeah, uh, I, I had a feeling when, uh, like, like we were sharing, uh, I think it was, Earlier, I think in the first half of the season before the World Cup break, or just uh-huh. after when, uh, uh, just before we hit into the winter, then I was like, oh, should, should I ask? Is this is gonna be you know, it's exciting, but yes, I thank you for risking it all. Uh, I sincerely <laughs> hope that this is the year, uh, Arsenal will win because for sure, oh, next year, Manchester United is going to be in the midst of everything because Eric Ten Hag has brought back hope. I, I, you know what? Oh, I, agree oh, with you, my I, I remember, I remember who you talk ah. about. Ah. Is, is Eric Ten Hag? Oh, yes. Yes, oh. I remember. Right. You were like, oh, if, yeah. if there is any manager that I want at uh, Arsenal, it is Eric Ten Hag. Right, right, yes. Exactly. I've, been, I've been a friend of his for a while. So when you guys got him, I was like, oh, here we go. United's yes. back. Oh United's my back. God. Yeah. 
Oh yeah, thanks for reminding me, man. I was thinking as well. Who, who is that fella? No, yes. yeah, because I, I was uh, to prepare for this. I was listening to our our past uh, this one. Then I, I remember in my head. Oh yeah, yeah. Hey, oh my God! I talk about Eric Ten Hag as as being a super solid manager, and he will hit the ground running if he went to the Premier League. I'm pretty sure he'll do well for Arsenal. I was like, okay, okay. I got to remember this. I got to remember this. But then, oh my God, it's such a brain fart just now. But when when I was like, oh, okay, Eric Ten Hag is coming back. Then I was like, oh, hold on. I was the one that mentioned Eric Ten Hag. <laughs> oh yes, indeed, my friend. Yeah. Yes. My and God. oh wow, yeah. So hindsight you know, I, is twenty twenty. But uh, oh man, you got to give props to the man for having that hindsight two years ago. Well, you know, uh. Look, I, you know, we, we, uh, we got our hits and misses, man. Yes. We got our hits and misses. And the next time uh, I'm back, I would love to hear more from you as well. Sure, that'd be quite fun. Sure. Uh, we'll <laughs> we'll probably hear from Ice uh, in the preseason uh, routine yep. that we have. And yes, yep. everybody, thank you again for joining us, Ice. Thank you again for your time. We hope to hear from you soon. All the best with all your. Uh, film endeavors. We at Bus Talks will definitely look out for Not Fair. Thank you. Come on, you gunners. All right. Take care. Bye, everybody. Bye.